This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Now in that case, I'm really delighted to introduce Naomi Tadmore from the University of Lancaster. I think many of us know your work on household, family um, and the Bible. So we're really looking forward to your paper today. So I'm going to hand over to you, Michael's up there, hand over you to get us started. Thank Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, This project forms part of my uh, British Academy uh, Leverhulme uh, project, which I'm very uh, lucky to be working on this year. Uh, And I have uh, uh, presented a different part of this project in the early modern seminar at the IHR uh, earlier uh, this year. So uh, I hope that uh, not too many people will have a sense of deja vu, but the argument uh, uh, develops in a different way. And... uh, Uh, takes us uh, to different places. It has often been affirmed that there was no law concerning settlement till the Statute of Charles II in 1662, explained the Justice of the Peace, the Reverend Richard Byrne, in his 1764 treatise on the origins of the poor law. But this notion, he elucidated, is not grounded upon fact. Byrne continued to provide evidence tracing the concept of settlement to the reign of Edward III and its consolidation to the Tudor era. The Statute of 39 Elizabeth, he said, was the first that mentions the word settlement. But already during the reign of Henry VIII, vagrants having been punished were to return to their settlement. Settlement is thus presented as an ancient concept rooted in the English person's birthright, property and sense of (coughs) home. 83 years later, the Dorset rector, Anthony Huxtable, described the concept of settlement using a similarly long-term time span. For him, Paris settlement was an historic source of attachment, an organic part of village life going a long way back. He said the remains, perhaps, of the feudal system. Historians continue to discuss the antiquity of settlement. Charles II's 1662 Act is acknowledged as a landmark, following which every person had a parish to which they legally belonged, that is their parish of settlement, and to which they could apply for relief from the proceeds of locally raised taxation. This sort of settlement, let me add, remained in force after the 1834 reform and was only removed from the statute books as late as 1948, where national eligibility came into force. But whereas scholars of the 18th century highlight the importance of not only the 1662 Act, but of subsequent legislation that modified the conditions for acquiring settlement in the 1680s and 90s, often going back to a much cited article by Taylor published in 1976, early modernists argue that the 1662 law followed existing practices and highlight instead the long-term effects of the Elizabethan legislation. At the same time, the transition from non-settlement to settlement or from implied to legally formalised settlement is little addressed from either the 17th century or the 18th century perspectives, while the relationship between entitlement and settlement remains unclear. Hindle, for example, describes it as a conceptual gloom and a dead end. To complicate matters still, scholars who specialise in the 18th and 19th centuries sometimes discuss the settlement of the poor with nostalgia, as if it encapsulated an organic sense of belonging embedded in the popular culture for a very long time, not unlike the sentiments expressed by Byrne and Huxtable, and uh, as I just noted. Most notably, Keith Snell identifies, and I quote, a strong feeling of parish belonging and settlement that gave the poor for centuries a sense of home. How ancient then was this concept of settlement? Was it the remains of the feudal system as the 19th century commentator declared? Or did it have more recent roots? And if so, when did it come about and how did it transform? Did the 17th century settlement laws signify much or were they a reflection of existing practices? And if so, what bearing did settlement have on entitlement? Much has been said about the making of uh, the notion of class in England and of our ability to discuss class in a period where a class terminology didn't exist as such. 
the study of settlement, I suggest, raises similar questions about the relationship between language, cultural conceptions, and society. So let us start then, and like many studies of this sort, uh, we can start by tracing the word settlement itself as an articulated verbal concept or a key word. Fortunately, present-day technology enables us to scan large corpora of digital resources and to determine with unprecedented accuracy the use of linguistic terms in the past, when they emerge, in what context, and how they changed over time. Lancaster's linguistics department has moreover developed an advanced search engine drawing on a rich version on, of uh, EBO, the large database of early English books online, with all known publications from the advent of print to 1700, and which I employ here. So the first part of my paper is dedicated to a computational analysis of the keyword settlement to shed light on its antiquity and formation including its historical collocations, which I shall trace through the CQP web search engine. Notions of settlement, as we shall see, <coughs> featured in diverse semantic contexts, but had shared nuances and resonances that reflected on one another and, in time, on the settlement of the poor. The second section proceeds to focus on the settlement of the poor itself and its legal formation, and the third turns to the 18th century, tracing the mass spread of the discourse of settlement and gauging its impact through other digital databases and archival case studies from counties as far apart as Lancashire and Sussex. This methodological focus on a key word, I suggest, enables us systematically to assess change and clarify concepts, including legal developments. And in this case, while uh, the diverse databases also help us to shed light on both discourses and uh, historical action. In 1776, Adam Smith famously commented, and I quote, that there is scarcely a poor man in England of 40 years of age who has not, in some part of his life, felt most cruelly oppressed by this ill-contrived law of settlement. Historians don't always agree. The analysis offered here suggests that however ideologically motivated Smith's words were, his assessment of the impact of settlement may not have been far from the truth. Concepts of settlement were by that time broadly widespread, albeit of recent origin. Their history furnishes us with a telling case study of the relationship between language, society, and the law, including, as we will see, also the law's unintended consequences. So with all this in mind, uh, let us start with uh, the language analysis. Corpus analysis through Lancaster's CQP web search engine shows that the keyword settlement wasn't ancient. In fact, in 1662, when Charles II issued his Settlement Act, this word was a relatively recent neologism. The start of the graph that you see here uh, shows the only two occurrences of the word settlement prior to the year 1600. The first, dated 1590, uh, is uh, a remonstrance on church discipline, and the second, 1599, as uh, appears uh, in a treatise on navigation by Richard Hacklett, referring to a place of settlement and habitation. These two represent different usages of the word that were to become common in years to come. The one indicating the act of establishing public affairs, etc., in security and tranquility, including legal agreements, and the other, a locality or persons settled in a locality, including their access to the local resources. By the end of the 17th century, as the figure indicates, as you could see here, usages of settlement had greatly increased to 9,540 um, hits in uh, 3,510 uh, files, printed text, different printed text. The changing profiles of youth within uh, the century are telling. Following the two late 16th century occurrences, settlement continued to appear in no more than 11 to 13 usages per decade until the end of the 1630s. 
But right at the start of 1640, it clearly had entered uh, the public arena in a new way. A text containing the word settlement by William Lord, uh, reprinted in 1639 on church worship, was seized immediately by the godly polemicist William Prynne, uh, writing against the role of bishops in the church hierarchy. And by the start of the next year, our keyword appeared in parliamentary debates. And on the 11th of May, 1641, it was coined in a letter in, a, in the king's own hand. From this point onwards, it was retorted in numerous tracts on the settlement of the peace and the just settlement sought in these stormy times. The revolutionary decade of the 1640s and 50s that saw an unprecedented surge of debates in print thus also witnessed a groundswell of ideas on settlement, which appeared as a buzzword employed by different speakers to designate what they saw as a desired solution for the issues of the time, for problems, for devotion and rule. And by the, 16th, sorry, by, by the 1650s, uh, the use of the word had reached 1,213 uh, occurrences uh, in printed text. A collocation analysis, which is also available through CQP web, through the CQP web search engine, further reveals the context of the debates and help us assess the development of our keyword. And we can see uh, the collocations here, uh, a selection of them. An array of collocations show how the word settlement was used to designate solutions to perceived problems. In 764 occurrences, settlement was employed together with the word peace, 236 times with the word church, echoing the political and religious debates of the civil wars. In 87 instances, it appeared together with the word true, such as the settlement of the true Protestant religion. Additional collocations show the collective conceptualization of the issues at stake, such as the 475 collocations of settlement with the plural pronoun our, our settlement, and 224 collocations with kingdom, uh, again, plural usages. In many cases, settlement appeared in relation not only to public affairs, but to the law. 401 usages of settlement recurred in the second half of the 17th century with the word act, denoting several laws. Such, for example, was the law, uh, for, was, uh, such, for example, was the new settlement after the late Happy Revolution, when William and Mary came to the throne. Other uh, such acts included an act for the settlement of the militia, for example, the militia of Barbados in 1699, or an act for the settlement of the size of stalls in London Market. In 1701, a crucial act of settlement secured the Protestant succession. Charles II's act, whereby uh, the poor gained settlement, was therefore only one of a number of late Stuart settlement laws. The settlement act cited most frequently concerned Ireland. Since 1652, a number of laws aimed at the total, I quote, reducement and settlement of Ireland were enacted, massively transferring land to Protestant hands. This usage thus shaded into the notion of settlement as plantation, which uh, we've just seen also in Hacklett's uh, uh, treatise that I just uh, mentioned. In the latter part of the 17th century, moreover, this discourse gained currency in the context of plantations worldwide. A cluster of coll collocations now appeared associating the word settlement with empire, trade, America, colony, and so on and so forth. The language of settlement thus developed to represent claims made by nations and peoples for the promotion of interests and the relocation of inhabitants, a nuance that also echoed in relation to the poor. Such usages of settlement conveyed a shift in our key word from the realm of public affairs to the settlement of personal claims and estates. Notions of rightful possession were first expressed with regard to the royal succession from around the middle decades of the 17th century as the return of Charles II was discussed as his settlement in his throne, which was seen to belong to him. And in the next generation, this sense was extended to James II's right to his throne. In a treatise by the non-juror 
uh, Dan Theophilus, for example, 1691, the word settlement recurred 76 times discussing wrongful possession of the usurped crown through illegal settlement and James's right for his settlement in his throne. In contrast, Sherlock argued that settlement was a term in law and once approved by Parliament, it must hold even if originally it rested on shaky foundations. The association of settlement, private estates and, the, and legal claims became further articulated uh, as the collocation marriage settlement came into use. The first known use uh, came, uh, appeared in the year 1679, uh, citing in fact an earlier reference uh, from 1658. Now this sort of legal settlement quickly spread to describe the arrangements made for the wife's access to financial resources which both reinforced and circumvented the common law doctrine of coverture. A related collocation that appeared around the same time was strict settlement uh, which settled the access of uh, heirs uh, to uh, uh, res the resource of, of the estate. And finally, the association of settlement, legal status and allowable resources uh, was expressed also with regard to the clergy whose parochial settlement, as distinct from the parish settlement of the poor, denoted the clergy's lawful right to receive tithes. And there are 28 uh, such records uh, in uh, printed uh, texts, no doubt many more in other media. By the year 1700 then, settlement had emerged as a much cited keyword with a broad array of usages and some common features. Many of its occurrences had to do directly with the law, from marriage and inheritance settlements to the validity of monarchical succession. Many had to do with solutions to perceived problems, whether the settlement of the crown, the reducement of Ireland, making provision for females despite the common law, and many settlements therefore also had to do uh, with access to resources as enabled by a legally allowed status, which itself was also often a result of settlement. It was thanks to settlement that the clergyman enjoyed his ties and the heir his patrimony. And it was settlement that permitted the married female to have access to allotted funds. And it was settlement that enabled the newcomer to uh, lay claims to territories abroad. It was settlement that gave the newly arrived prince access to the throne. And it was settlement that enabled the pauper to have lawful habitation in a parish and to lay claims, if necessary, to parish relief. So let's proceed to the second section on the emergence of the settlement of the poor. In 1633, the Assize judges debated the following question. What accompted lawful settling in a parish and what not? Their answer did little to dispel the fog. This is too general a question to receive a perfect answer, they replied. For the Westmoreland Justice, Richard Byrne, writing a century later in 1755, the legal situation was entirely different. His 46-page discussion of settlement started with 10 conditions under which legal settlement took effect, and those included settlement by marriage, whereby the husband's settlement extended to the wife as a part of coverture, the settlement of children with their parents, whereby legitimate children inherited their status by patrilineal descent, service for one year and fully indentured apprenticeship, following which settlement was acquired, uh, property rental above the threshold of £10 per annum, the bearing of parish office and parish residence for a continuing period of 40 days, preceded by formal public notice. Evidently, by that time, settlement was a structured legal status. Essentially, it protected its bearer against removal and made it possible for the person to claim parish relief. However newly formed this concept of settlement was, the general notion that English people had a place of residence to which they belonged and to which they could return had a long history. Already during the reign of Henry VIII, justices of, of the peace were to go through their locality once a month and remove any poor who didn't belong to that place. In 1572, 
newcomers who threatened to become needy were to be sent to where they were most conversant and had their last abiding within the past three years. From the reign of James I, the qualifying period was reduced to one year. But by the 1650s, a change can be observed. The advice literature for magistrates started revealing then a more structured notion of settlement, using indeed the new noun, settlement itself, rather than any other reference to settling or placing or sending persons. The 1656 manual for magistrates by the leading Cromwellian judge, William Shepherd, contained for the first time not only a 19-page section on advice about the poor, but a two-page section dedicated specifically to settlement. The issue at stake was the definition of legal settlement, a point that was evidently in flux because it didn't appear in the first edition of the same manual published in 1650, uh, nor in others uh, uh, beforehand. The guidance reflected the principles of the 1633 uh, uh, decisions, weird additions that were to become later incorporated in the Act of 1662. Whoever came into a parish for one month uh, was said to be settled there and thereafter couldn't be removed, which followed the 1633 resolutions. A key issue remained the pauper's known presence in the parish and familiarity with inhabitants, which is also evident in petitions from around that period that mention specifically the years of residence uh, as a key to uh, entitlement. One settlement was defined by a dedicated act, as happened in 1662, such conditions became redundant. By the 18th century, there were many people whose settlement was entirely a legal matter, who, uh, with no relation at all to actual dwelling, let alone to being conversant uh, with the neighbours. Another subtle but telling change in the Crowellian guidelines concerned removal. Since the time of Henry VIII, itinerant poor were to be handled from constable to constable. It was only in 1572 that the Office of Overseer of the Poor was created with duties that didn't include conveying the poor. But by 1650, the issue was addressed as a matter of settlement. While rogues were still to be delivered through the constable following the Elizabethan law, a poor man was to be sent to the place of his last settlement under the authority of the parish's civil officers, the church wardens and overseers of the peace. Two lawful venues for removal were thereby articulated, one under the vagrancy laws uh, and the other for a breach of settlement, which remained the case for uh, the next two centuries. The relationship between poor people's settlement and their entitlement to resources was also spelled out as the Cromwellian guidelines explained in no uncertain terms that the parish must relieve them. It was probably not a coincidence that these new regulations were formulated in the 1650s, a time when new justices were recruited and when the magistracy played a crucial role in maintaining law and order in the face of great upheaval. The legal profession was generally on the rise and the revolutionary and late Stuart parliaments were filled by an unprecedented number of gentlemen trained at the ends of court. As soon as the restoration took effect and justices such as Shepherd had to retire to private life while parishes were awash with demobilized soldiers and the prices of grain uh, were rising, the need for an updated settlement legislation was evident. Moreover, after more than a century of population growth, the trend was arrested and from around 1660, the population was in decline. The fear of the itinerant poor that had plagued populations and rulers in Tudor times didn't disappear, but now had to be balanced against labour needs. And so as soon as Charles II returned to England, the key word settlement became incorporated in new bills, which soon became a new act. The long-term implications of the 1662 law of settlement and removal, as it came to be known, stood in direct opposition to the haphazard uh, way in which the law was enacted. The act was preceded by four private bills and comprised a select amalgamation of all four with no more than little discussion by a committee in which the king's ministers and chief lawyers in the house didn't attend. The 25 approved clauses, which Hitchcock and Shoemaker very aptly describe as hodgepodge, um, drew on current practices but went further. 
A period of 40 days was defined during which the newcomer could be removed to last settlement. Yet those with rented property worth more than £10 per annum were granted settlement outright uh, once they inhabited that property for 40 days, which was an innovation. The law clarified that persons going to work in another parish, such as at harvest time, would gain no settlement by virtue of their itinerant poor, uh, by, of their itinerant work, no matter how long they stayed, thereby establishing a rift between settlement and actual habitation, which only increased over time. A separate section stipulated certification, unless they were equipped with a certificate from local, local officers, seasonal workers were to be removed, their families at any rate were seen as left behind, and single workers were not allowed certification under the law. A mechanism for taking securities from migrants to prevent them from becoming a burden on the parish had already been regulated by the local courts since the 1640s, as Hindle has shown, while the use of passes for labourers was known since medieval times. This aspect of the 1662 law, therefore, modified existing practices and created a formal mechanism of certification which proved to be much more flexible and versatile and widespread than the securities of old. Following the Cromwellian instructions, the new act also placed removal in the hands of the overseer of the poor and JPs, while the quarter sessions uh, were to act as courts of appeal. Provision was made for the recruitment of new constables to deal separately with the removal of vagrants. And finally, the northern townships were given the power to act as uh, parishes for the purposes of the settlement law because the northern parishes were vast and couldn't function efficiently. The 1662 legislation thus established settlement as a legal status defining access to resources and habitation, not unlike other contemporaneous settlements that establish uh, status, resources and claims. The contemporary conception whereby one's <coughs> property in a property constituted in itself a property right echoed here too before long writers started discussing this settlement too in terms of natural liberty, property and freedom. While the 1662 law restricted the migration of the poor in as far as it facilitated certification and removal, <laughs> including the preemptive removal of those likely to be chargeable, the overall effect of the law was in fact to make labour mobility easier for a person was now rendered irremovable once he or she stayed in the same place with no complaint arising for more than 40 days. The migrant male could moreover be protected by a certificate. Conversely, those defined as incorrigible rogues could be removed to any of the English plantations beyond the seas. And an explicit association between the settlement of the poor at home and the settlement of overseas was thus also um, uh, articulated and invoked in the law. This 1662 Act resulted in local dissatisfaction and legal confusion. And once again, the change happened to coincide with population trends, this time renewed growth. From 1685, several laws were enacted to restrict settlement by habitation of 40 days. The 18th century culture of settlement, sometimes described as ancient, therefore, owed its origins uh, not directly to the 1662 laws, but to later restrictions introduced uh, piecemeal under the reigns of James II and William III. Between 1685 and 1692, it was established that the crucial 40 days counted only from when the migrant informed the parish of his or her arrival in writing and published the notice in church, which obviously was unlikely to happen, and that was the gist of the law. Uh, it was to prevent it from happening. And it meant ipso facto that all those whose presence was not duly announced could now be summarily removed, uh, which uh, did happen. Uh, rather than introducing settlement by merit, as described by Taylor, uh, this amendment made settlement, in fact, much harder to get and made removal considerably easier. Only the apprentices indenture and annual uh, contract uh, uh, and, and annual service contracts now counted as the written and public notice periods for the purposes uh, of settlement and guaranteed their bearers new settlement for as long as the correct hiring procedure was followed. 
At the same time, the settlement of soldiers and sailors uh, was suspended during active service, which simplified mobilization for the Nine Years' War, but had, immense, uh, had an immense impact on military families, which now were much more exposed to dislocation. By 1697, the settlement certificate was extended not only to the bearer, but also to his wife and family, thereby making settlement hereditary and subject to coverture. The separation between parish belonging and actual habitation was thus fully established under these laws, as was the contractual nature of settlement rather than any organic notion of belonging. The 1697 law further defined the settlement certificate's format in the process more than doubling the number of persons required for its administration and barring the bearer from gaining any new settlement for as long as the certificate was in force. The overall result was that by the middle decades of the 18th century, when Byrne was writing his manual, there were already two, if not three, generations of people with derived and inherited settlement throughout the realm who had their parish settlement passed down to them from their parents or even grandparents or if they were wives from their husbands and who had at best a limited ability of gaining parish settlement in their own right. And so by the start of the 18th century, wives, clerics, heirs, colonizing, uh, colonizers, estates, kingdoms, parishes, monarchs and paupers all had their respective settlements. These settlements all required legal frameworks or at least forcefully articulated claims for their instruments to stand. Many settlements addressed problems and created others and were essential for establishing status, resources and claims. The settlement of the poor, fully enshrined in law, soon became a part of the national culture. Indeed, it had become so ingrained that it started to appear ancient. So with this in mind, let us go to the third section and further trace the spread of settlement in, and the context in which it featured, moving from text analysis to some of the impacts of the law. And I'll start with uh, a couple of brief case studies. On Christmas Day of 1760, James Marchant, a Sussex tailor, must have felt at home. He spent the holy day together with his sister and his sweetheart Elizabeth and other neighbours and kin, and about two years later he and Elizabeth married. No sooner had they married than trouble started. The parish where they lived, East Hothly, Sussex, was tolerant of single male newcomers, but had a different attitude altogether to families with unproven means. James, whose wife was now pregnant, could potentially become chargeable, while Elizabeth's parents in the village had already mortgaged their farm and couldn't be relied upon for help. And so James was removed by an order of the Justice of the Peace to where the overseer uh, called his parish, which was about 18 miles away, where James was born and where his father still lived, but where James himself hadn't resided since his early teens. In the trial that followed, James and his father tried to argue their case, but it was clear cut. James had been apprenticed to his uncle in East Hothly, but upon the making the agreement, the uncle declared that he would not gain settlement in this parish. James' service was therefore not properly indentured and couldn't qualify for settlement. Only with the aid of a certificate could he and his wife and child return home. Settlement was a legal status which they lacked and the heads of settlement as listed by Byrne were known to all. For Alice Lord, probably born in St Anne's, Lancashire, Christmas of 1760 was less happy. On the 13th of December, she was apprehended in Liverpool together with her son and on the same day the removal order for her and her son was sealed. And... Uh, this is, in fact, I should have shown you, this is James Marchant's settlement certificate, and this is the removal order for uh, Anne, uh, for Alice uh, Lord. <coughs> Alice had no uh, settlement in Liverpool, nor any chance of getting one. However, her examination revealed that in this case, too, all the parties concerned knew the rules of the game, and this is her examination. The magistrate's questions must not have come to Alice as a surprise. 
She confirmed that she was married in Rochdale Church, which immediately meant that her settlement was to be confirmed by coverture. She was then able to name her husband's settlement, saying that he was bound apprentice to one Richard Lord Weaver in Rossendale by indenture for seven years, which time he served under the said indenture, and whereof he gained settlement in Rossendale aforesaid. She was able to inform the magistrate that since Richard had never done anything to destroy his settlement, nor has she since his death. The word destroy indicates the importance of the status concern. The woman thus expressed her desire to be sent to Rossendale, and to clinch the point, she also asserted that she had frequently been relieved by the officers of the said township, and so she went. And on Christmas Day, 1760, she was probably on her way. In the event, uh, she never reached Rossendale, but was stopped in Colchurch in Warrington Parish, where her papers were stored in the parish chest and where they remain. The cultist overseer of the poor may have noticed that while the woman's name appeared in her examination as Alice, the removal order, if you go back here, uh, uh, actually named her as Mary. A closer inspection might have discovered that it wasn't Richard Lord who married Alice at Rochdale, but one named John, whereas Richard, probably John's brother, married Mary two years later. Uh, in the same church. Perhaps the clerk confused the names, or perhaps the woman was employing her brother and sisters in law identity in order to get out of Liverpool and to get Rossendale. Both her case and James Marchant's offer us a glimpse of kinship networks in operation, brokering service and support over a radius of up to 50 miles, uh, a pattern which historians of the family are very familiar with. Once settlement had emerged, however, and was defined in law, it became a factor in its own right. And it really shows to us how difficult it was for poor families often to maintain these kinship networks in the face of uh, settlement uh, uh, regulations, which were deeply present in the considerations of the poor and of the local authorities which we, with which they dealt and uh, in this case, too, clearly all sides knew the rules of the game. The articulated concept of settlement, which first entered the advice literature in 1656, as we just saw, uh, and the statute books in 1662, and which was clarified by 1697 through patchy legislation, had evidently become a fact of life for people such as James uh, Marchant and Alice Lord and the authorities with which they dealt. In 1633, the assize judges struggled to explain the meaning of the phrase lawfully settled. By the next century, it had acquired a highly structured sense. The law's emphasis had shifted from the control of migration to the management of habitation. The large-scale routine administration was in the hands of not only justices of the peace and petty sessions acting singly, uh, but, but also justices acting singly, while the quarter sessions worked largely as courts of appeal. The responsibilities of the overseer of the poor had significantly increased. In many cases, a gap yawned between legal settlement and actual habitation. The outcome of the cumulative legislation was that parishes had dwellers of different estates. Those who had settlement were entitled to apply for poor relief uh, and to participate in the politics of the parish, to quote uh, Keith Wrightson's phrase, according to the local custom. Others were second-class inhabitants, living under the force of a certificate, and yet others were sojourners and could be tolerated, made welcome or not. Alice Lord, for example, no doubt blended in in the crowd in Liverpool until she attracted attention. James Marchant was both removed and allowed to return. Conventions of settlement and removal, hotly debated by historians, were always selectively applied and cannot be described in any sweeping terms. Yet while a certificate ban, uh, such as uh, James Marchant, as the phrase now uh, came to describe his status, had such a certificate man may have been grateful for his continued residence in the parish, he no doubt also knew the implications of his estate. For as long as he lived under the power of a certificate, he was prevented from gaining new settlement unless he managed to gain 
uh, uh, to rent property worth more than £10 per annum, which was unlikely, because even some of the members of the middling sort in that parish could barely scrape that threshold. It was a lot of money. And he couldn't participate in the parish vestry, where the local men met and where much business was transacted. He would constantly have to ingratiate himself uh, to his powerful neighbours, particularly the farmers who paid most of the rents, uh, at most of the rates, sorry, and whose eye was quick to spot any needy newcomer. And at the same time, it would be hard for someone such as James to relocate, and he would transmit his status to his offspring. In any event, his wife had already been stripped of her natal settlement in the parish upon marriage, and should James die or become ill, she could be now obliged to leave her kin and her parish of birth and uh, relocate to a place in which she'd never lived. Computational analysis shows us how others had to negotiate similar circumstances. And you can see here the wonderful database, London Lives, which contains uh, 240,000 transcribed archival documents from central London covering the period 1680 to 1800, complements the computational analysis of Ebo chronologically and substantively, as it is a unique database of handwritten and administrative examinations, warrants and forms, the stuff of the daily management of the settlement laws. In the following graph, our keyword is traced through that database. So the starting point is 1680, corresponding to the peak which we've seen in the first figure. So if we could just look back, uh, the peak here of the uses of settlement is the start here, okay, uh, 1680. Um, uh, and in, 16, in the 1680s, we see 165 hits of settlement rising to 322 uh, in the decade starting 1700, 834 in the decade starting 1710, 1162 in the 1730s, uh, 1,449 in the 1750s, rising to 3,900 by the 17, uh, 1790s, an overall uh, uh, rise of 236.4%. Uh, in provincial archives, thousands of similar documents survive. Liverpool, where Alice Lord was apprehended, was about 270 miles away from James Marchant's home in Sussex. But the pattern demonstrated by these distant counties was very similar, which is evident despite the document's patchy survival. Following our keyword in provincial archives, we can see that the as the legislation changed in the 1690s, parishes started demanding and receiving settlement documents at an unprecedented rate. In St. Michael Lewis, for example, the first settlement certificate appeared in the year 1699, followed by 91 surviving forms until 1794. In Stenning, West Sussex, uh, the first document of this sort appeared in 1697, 90 surviving until the uh, 1770s. In the Lancashire townships of Down Holland, Ufton and Great Harwood, for example, once again the first settlement certificate appeared in 1699 and the uh, uh, numbers of uh, survival are actually pretty similar. The archival data further enables us to speculate on the broader impact of settlement. In a village of 100 households, for example, even certification at the rate of one case per year would have cumulatively affected 10% of the household within a decade, with a disproportionately large impact among the poor. In a parish such as East Hothly in Sussex, for example, which in the 1801 census still numbered no more than 395 inhabitants, the effect of the two settlement documents filed in 1757 was large. The diary of the overseer of the poor shows that he spent in that year at least 108 days 
partly or wholly on parish matters, frequently dealing with settlement and usually going about his business with other parishioners while engaging with people from around the neighbourhood and uh, a wide range of officials and, and other uh, uh, ordinary neighbours. He hardly ever went on this business on his own. He always was accompanied by other, other men. Even the simplest case required six to eight signatories and at least two addresses, in addition to the bearer and his or her family, which meant that the impact rippled and rippled. In places such as Kirkham, Lancashire and Wadhurst, Sussex, for example, where annual certifications sometimes reach doubled figures, 17, 20, sometimes even more certificates per year, uh, the impact must have been uh, large. If we take into account that the surviving evidence is partial and that uh, this example doesn't touch at all upon matters of removal and examination, it is possible to surmise that the impact of settlement was in fact greater. A rough calculation based on one settlement case per year per parish during the period 1690 to 1700 would thus yield a notional figure of 1,200,000 cases of settlement uh, for the 15,000 uh, parishes of England and Wales. A conservative estimate in view of the fact that the number of surviving settlement documents in provincial archives is roughly about half a million. Taking into account examinations, removal, and the business of the sessional courts, uh, at least half of which was dedicated in the 18th century to uh, matters of settlement, we we'll reach a notional minimum uh, figure of 4,800,000 cases in 80 years, mostly dealing with families rather than single persons, which further increases the impact on the English population which uh, the English population, which in 1801, uh, just to give us a sense, numbered uh, eight, uh, just a, a, a bit over eight and a half million. Uh, and of course, we have to remember also uh, the uh, figure of about six and a half million who migrated away from England between 1700 and 1780, seeking new settlement overseas. So if we estimate six individuals processing every settlement case and four every removal, uh, which again is pretty minimal, uh, the number of individually carried out administrative actions relating to settlement mounts up to an estimated 26 million and a half uh, actions in an 80 year period or just over 900 per day. While some of these actions were swift, others could be uh, complex. It is hardly surprising that an economist such as Adam Smith and a jurist such as Richard Byrne expressed objection to the system. Finally, uh, we can chart the engagement of eight other 18th century writers with settlement, investigating printed texts uh, like uh, Ebo files which reflect the massive rise in the usages of settlement from around the 1640s. The database of 18th century collections, ECHO, shows the continuation of this trend. And here the figure rises from uh, 1,473 files containing the keyword in 1700 to 2,778 in the next decade. Uh, 4,430 by the 1760s when James Marchant and Alice Lord were dealing with their settlement and the number continues to rise to 7,300 hits for the 1790s and a total uh, usage, total number of usages 33,184 uh, in uh, printed text from the 18th century uh, containing at least one usage of are the keyword settlement. And those include, for example, the 56 editions of uh, 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 Burns, uh, the Justice of the Peace and the Parish Officer, uh, and 38 items by Adam Smith. So let me now conclude. Scholars of British history have long debated to what extent it is possible to identify class in a period when the concept class hadn't emerged. A similar question should be raised with regard to settlement, and it's used by historians in periods before the legal concept settlement had been formulated, and indeed before the word had uh, even appeared. 
While the application of heuristic categories has merit, anachronistic projection carries risk in this deck case of conflating different social practices and misclassifying, uh, changing our, our manifestations of entitlement. A systemic keyword analysis has served us here as a prism through which change could be viewed. From around the 1640s, the keyword settlement had come to the fore and was much used in political and religious discourses. Increasingly, it featured not only in the context of the common wheel, but in legal contexts pertaining to individuals. From 16, around 1660, it came to denote diverse legal arrangements, establishing status and access to resources. The 1662 law of settlement was only one of a number of settlement acts, and the contemporaneous notions of settlement had features in common, like the marriage settlement for wives, the clergy's parochial settlement, the strict settlement of heirs, or the settlement of the royal succession, so did the settlement of the poor define status and access to resources entailed. And like the settlement in plantations uh, abroad, so did the laws for the settlement of the poor facilitate the relocation of migrants. Similar conceptions of property echo throughout. Notions of parish belonging, therefore, undoubtedly had a long history, but were subject to change. Whereas in 1633, the Assize judges struggled to define lawful settlement, by the start of the 18th century, the term had come to denote structured arrangements. If in the 17th century, entitlement was shrouded in conceptual gloom, to quote Hindle, for example, in the next century, even a poor widow, such as Alice Lord, knew exactly which heads of settlement to cite. By the start of, uh, at the sa by the same, um, by that time, the business of settlement had increased to occupy much of the work of the quarter sessions, which now function uh, as a busy uh, court of appeal, while magistrates did a great deal of work alongside overseers of the poor, whose role had expanded, as seen here, to deal with settlement. The overall rise of the concept of settlement was traced through all known printed texts from the advent of print to 1700 and then further on uh, uh, through uh, catalogued and uh, scanned printed texts to 1800, while trends identified in print were seen to be complemented by the rise of uh, the use of our keyword in administrative documents. Examples from Lancashire, Sussex, and metropolitan London reveal similar patterns. Once settlement developed and was enshrined in law then, it became a force in its own right and had decisive effects. From land ownership in Ireland to the royal succession and from property, the propertied females to the habitation of the poor. A tentative calculation of the impact of the legislation for the settlement of the poor had suggested that it led to at least uh, about 26 and a half million individual actions over 900 per day. Adam Smith's complaint about the wide-ranging effect for, uh, of the settlement legislation were probably not far from the truth. The long-term consequences of the legislation regarding se the settlement of the poor, however, contrasted sharply with the haphazard and piecemeal manner in which the law was enacted as we also saw viewing the laws. It was the cumulative and unintended consequences of the law that created the culture of settlement that came to rule the lives of millions for years to come. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. Thank you.